if you're buying your tools, if you're buying your planes, you have a lot of choices. You can choose tradition or a little bit of Europe. You can go with the reliable old standard or yesterday's forgotten invention or you can choose a strange romantic sense of mystery that's somehow captured in a lump of wood and iron. It's an option. If you've even thought about buying hand tools, you've heard someone talk about infill planes. Oh, but it's more like this. Infill planes. There is so much myth and legend built up around these tools that it's like they're the Freemasons or the Illuminati. Well, maybe that's overselling it, but these tools are soaked in rumor and hype. And as a woodworker, you might be wondering what all the fuss is about. I mean, it's a plane, right? Yes, it's a plane. It takes shavings off wood. But why does it look so different? I mean, it looks like a British sports car. All flowing curves and the occasional awkward lump just to let you know it's from sturdy old England. The design of this plane is saying something. It's saying luxury, refinement, tradition. Oh, and money. These things cost a boatload of money. From the very start, these were upper crust tools for British cabinet makers and high-end furniture. Metal bodied planes date back to the Roman Empire, but they mostly disappeared during the Middle Ages, and wooden planes dominated carpentry and furniture making for over a thousand years. Slowly, small numbers of metal planes began appearing as specialty instrument makers tools and miter planes designed for tough end grain trimming. These tools were rare, and most woodworkers never touched one until the 19th century, when the Industrial Revolution exploded across Europe and America and everything changed forever. A woodworker in the 1800s would have seen the rise of steam power and highly organized factories that could turn out large numbers of identical objects. These new technologies revolutionized industry, but steam engines were huge and their power was mostly stationary. Crafts like furniture making and house building were still out in the field where tools were powered by human muscle. As the industrial age picked up speed, these tools transitioned from craftsman made to factory made before finally giving over completely to new designs made from inexpensive and durable cast iron and steel, materials that could now be made consistently and in large quantities. In America, lots of manufacturers were experimenting with cast iron, mechanically adjustable planes, and there was heavy competition in the market. But when Stanley purchased Leonard Bailey's patents, they quickly dominated the industry and squeezed most of their competition to the margins. Metallic planes are heavier and more fragile than wooden planes. Cast iron is brittle, but metal planes aren't affected by climate and don't warp with the seasons. Their soles don't wear and their mouths don't open, so the craftsman never has to spend time patching a worn plane. Metallic planes were more expensive than wooden planes, but they could last a craftsman his entire career, and the mechanical adjuster is easy to learn if you're new on the job. In the high volume, high demand Victorian era, metal planes had a clear edge. Back in Britain, English tool makers saw the advantage of metal plane construction, and their tradition of steel miter planes stuffed with wood suggested a new way of making all the planes in a cabinet maker's kit. By the early 1800s, British and Scottish plane makers were already handcrafting bench planes encased in metal. Many of these were straightforward copies of existing wooden designs, just wrapped in a metal shell. Some of these metal planes were based on iron castings, but craftsmen were also developing the technique of dovetailing metal parts together. Although it was labor intensive and took a skilled worker to execute, dovetailed construction in steel and other metals created a plane that was stable, highly durable, and moved smoothly across the wood. Rather than making the whole plane out of metal parts like the Americans, Scottish and British plane makers filled their planes with dense timbers like rosewood. Combining wood and metal parts into a working tool required lots of handwork, and all the precise hand fitting meant that these tools would never be well suited for factory production. As the industrial age sped up and mass produced goods overtook handmade ones, the infill plane just couldn't compete. They were always made in relatively small numbers and always expensive. Even at the height of their production, an infill plane from an established maker cost almost double the comparable Stanley and was triple the cost of a traditional wooden plane. Ironically, the elite craftsmanship and luxurious materials of the infill were the very things that doomed this plane. The major infill makers struggled through World War II, 
and soon after the war, most of them disappeared. Now, if you're used to using a vintage Stanley plane, you might wonder what's different about the infill. Well, the infill plane is finely made, but kind of clumsy. It's a lot heavier, and that weight is kind of a liability at the bench. It's not nimble and easy to move around like the Bailey pattern plane is. The interiors of these planes are also very different. You've got the Bailey, which has a metallic frog. That's got the adjuster built in, but the frog itself is also movable, and you can take it out if you need to file away a little bit or even replace it. The infill is totally different. The bed of the plane is just a solid piece of wood that is pinned to the metal shell. You can't take it out, you can't adjust it, you really can't do anything to it. The infill also has an extremely fine mouth much finer than the Stanley. And that's saying something, because most of my Stanleys have really fine mouths, and they fight tear out really effectively. But the infill is honestly on a totally different level. Now, there's also kind of a mythology about infill plans. People want to explain why they work well, why they fight tear out effectively. And here's the theory. The infill has a very tight mouth. The iron is pitched a little bit higher, more like 47 degrees. The plane has a ton of mass, and the wood stuffing combined with the rigid metal shell is supposed to, this is really the explanation, dampen harmonic vibrations, which makes the plane stay in the cut and resist chattering. Honestly, I have no idea. At the bench, both of these planes take a respectable shaving. There's the Stanley, and here's the infill. They're both really nice, but there are some important differences. The Stanley has just a, just a very nimble feel. It's always light on the wood, and it's kind of gliding over the surface. Except if it runs into problem areas, like I have some reversing grain at the end of this board. This Stanley is finely set and very sharp, but do you hear? There's a little thunk right at the end there, and that's the plane actually catching that grain and either tearing out a little bit or chattering skipping over it a tiny bit. Now, the infill's totally different in this way. The infill doesn't go over anything. It goes through. So, as I'm using the plane, it moves through whatever grain I put in front of it, and it always takes a shaving. This thing is like driving a precision snowplow. But, I should point out that the Stanley's also a lot more versatile. Both of these planes are good for surfacing. The infill probably has an edge there, but I do a lot more than surface with my planes. So, let me get this piece of wood here, and for instance, I might want to chamfer the edge of it. And the Stanley is fantastic for that. It's easy to balance, and it's quick to adjust. So while I'm working on the wood, I can make this chamfer really fast and very precisely, and it's not difficult. I just might want to round over one of the edges to make a panel or a detail. Well, the Stanley also makes that easy. I can switch the board around in the vise and come right across the end grain. And now I've created an excellent round over detail right here. It's very easy for this plane to do. Now, the infill might do some of these things, but God, it's just, it's like a boat anchor. You just don't really want to use it for these tasks because it is so heavy and clunky. It also doesn't have the versatility because the infill plane has a fixed mouth. It's very fine and it can't be widened. I should also point out that this one and a lot of infill smoothing planes have curved sides, which reduces the weight, but it means you can't use them on a shooting board because they rock back and forth. This is a cabinet maker's tool. It is for fine woodwork. It's for surfacing. It's not a general purpose plane, and it's not gonna replace your day-to-day -day bench plane. So look, I'm a practical craftsman. I care how things work. And in my tool reviews, I am the hype deflator, the bull destroyer. I won't let the tool companies get away with anything. And let me tell you, this plane is, honestly, it's kinda great. I meant all the things I said before. This tool is bulky and heavy. It's not very versatile. It won't take a heavy cut. Hell, it won't even take a medium cut. But if you've got a tricky piece of wood with figure or reversing grain, you can probably plane it with this tool. The plane I'm using in this video is a Norris, and they were the only company to sell infills with an effective mechanical adjuster. 
This single stem above the blade controls both the depth and lateral adjustment. And it's not some quaint old curiosity. It works really well. In fact, lots of modern manufacturers are now making versions of the Norris adjuster, even on mid-priced planes. A plane like this one can't be your do-everything bench plane, but it's also not meant to be. If you want to add one of these to your toolkit, you should think of it as a specialty tool. It won't replace your standard smoother or jack for most operations, but you can keep it sharp and finely set and pull it out just at the end of each piece. For getting that final surface on the board, this tool compares favorably with the Lee Nielsen and Veritas planes I've tested. I'm not saying it's just as good, but it's in the ballpark, and it cost me less. And this all brings us to those final questions. Do you want one of these? How do you get one? Well, as to the first question, I would say this is not an essential tool, but it is a useful tool. These planes were never made in the huge numbers that Stanley planes were, but they were very popular with British cabinet makers at a time when those guys were turning out some high-level work. If you aspire to that kind of fancy, high-level cabinet work, you probably want one of these underneath your bench. So how do you get one? Well, my first piece of advice is not eBay. There are lots of vintage infills floating around the internet, and with all of those numbers, you are going to find some bad repairs, some modified planes, and some downright forgeries being pushed by unscrupulous dealers. None of that is stuff that you want to get into. The first thing you need to do is educate yourself about these tools. For that, I recommend Hans Brunner's excellent book. It's a good read, not very expensive, and I will link to it down in the description. After you get educated, I suggest that you buy from a reputable tool dealer. I bought this plane from Patrick Leach. He is a super well-known American tool dealer with a sterling reputation for only selling the best goods. And I'm very happy with the plane that I bought from him. I will link to him down in the description as well. Now, because I educated myself before I bought this plane, I knew exactly what I wanted. This is a post-war Norris plane, and the post-war Norris planes are not very collectible. They were no longer dovetailed construction. Instead, Norris had switched to a cast iron body, not very different from Stanley. They also had gotten rid of rosewood, and instead, this plane is infilled with common beech that's been stained to look like rosewood. These things make the tool much less desirable to collectors, and also a lot cheaper. But they still work really well. All the key elements are still there, and Norris was still producing a pretty high-quality tool. This tool is also good as a user tool because it's, well, it's newer. I mean, a lot of infills date from the 1850s or even earlier, and a lot of those planes are just, they're worn out. This one isn't. The mouth is still tight. The adjuster isn't sloppy. There's still plenty of iron left. This is a working tool. And, you know, I'll be honest, there's also... <sighs> Look, I don't go in for all that warm, fuzzy stuff with tools, but there is a sense of history here. This tool came out of Great Britain just after the war. Norris, like so many other British institutions, barely survived the war years. And when they emerged, they were a diminished version of themselves, making a slightly less high-quality product than before. But I do like to think about everything that they survived. I mean, Hitler, the Nazis, the Blitz, my God, they, they soldiered on after all of that, and they were still producing a high-level tool. Norris wasn't the same after the war, but nobody else was either. And I kind of like thinking about all that stuff, and when I use this plane, honestly, it gives me a little thrill. Now, you might be interested in the history of woodworking and getting more into the details. If you are, I highly recommend Mortis and Tenon magazine. This is their newest issue, it just came out, and Mortis and Tenon is by far my favorite woodworking magazine. It's pretty expensive, but it's worth it. Every time it comes in the mail, it's like you're getting a complete woodworking book. I get super excited when it shows up, and I really recommend that you subscribe to these guys. I will link to them in the description as well. And before I go, I always have to say that these videos just wouldn't be possible without my patrons on Patreon. They give me the support and the encouragement and the community that lets me research and script and film and edit and put together these videos and give them to everybody for free, which I love doing and I want to keep doing it. If you'd like to be part of making that possible, go on over to patreon.com slash rexkruger and check out all the rewards I have for the people who make these videos possible. And of course, I know that I'm only here because I have great viewers. 
So thanks for watching.